To reach out to the stars and send spaceships across the interstellar void is a titanic task, but so is setting up an entirely new ecosystem and civilization on the other side. What happens if those fragile oases fail to take root and prosper? The Fermi Paradox is the big question about why the Universe appears to contain billions and billions of planets, many vastly older than our own pale blue dot, and yet seems to be absent any huge and ancient galactic empires. They would also be loud aliens, the kind that make a big splash on the galactic stage, and their noise would last for a while, maybe thousands of years or potentially even more, so they would be hard for observers like ourselves to miss. If our future is out among the stars, then surely it was for others who came before us too, and so we ask, where they all are? Today we'll be discussing a new possible explanation, Pancosmoyo Theory, in conjunction with Percolation Theory and the Aurora Effect, as a possible new late filter of the Fermi Paradox, to ask if maybe it's simply too difficult to find or create environments away from Earth on which civilizations can thrive in the long term beginning with creating ecologies that could survive deep space missions to new solar systems. Pancosmoyo, meaning all world limit, is a new concept and makes a strong case for the difficulty of colonization, though in many ways it is an old argument too, indeed arguably the original argument that solves the Fermi Paradox. This answer to the Fermi Paradox dates back to Enrico Fermi himself. He reasoned that the colonization of new worlds is just very very hard and doesn't happen much, if at all. When Fermi expressed that opinion in 1950, it was over a decade before we started the space race, but not long after he'd helped invent nuclear weapons, so he was, understandably, a bit dubious on two important late filters. One, our ability to survive without blowing ourselves to smithereens, and two, whether space travel, let alone space colonization, was possible when nothing had yet been sent into space. And we call these two our late filters of the Fermi Paradox, things humanity has yet to pass through on our way to becoming a big interstellar species that might be detected by someone else. Filters are those steps on the way to answering the Fermi Paradox, and an example of an early filter, the kind we already went through, would be living on a planet that's warm enough for life to survive, or a species on that planet evolving a sophisticated brain that could figure out space travel. We have dozens of proposed early filters, and many late ones too, but the late ones mostly fall into two categories, not blowing ourselves up, and finding a way to make interstellar travel and settlement practical. Our default perspective on this show is that the Fermi Paradox has no good solution yet, but that the least bad one is that those early filters just pile up to make life rare, and intelligent and technological life rare still, so much so that there's probably none within a billion light years of us, and our reasoning for this is based on three key assumptions. First is that it's critical to all great filter approaches to the Fermi Paradox that there is no detectable alien presence here on Earth. Obviously many disagree, but it's not much of a paradox if they are actively here now. Second is that while our knowledge of science is hardly complete, our current understanding of the way the universe and biology works is sufficiently correct for us to be able to discuss the problem. As with the first assumption, there's no paradox if we are horribly wrong about the size or age of the universe or Darwin was wrong or we all live in a tailored simulation. Needless to say, many proposed solutions for the Fermi Paradox work by challenging those first two cases. The third, though, is the assumption that we can make long-lasting civilizations elsewhere, because there's no paradox if everyone is stuck on their home planet so long as intelligent life isn't so common that there's been a million alien civilizations independently arising in our galaxy already. Even tens of thousands makes it very unlikely that we'd be able to hear any of them, especially as the inability to leave their homeworld yet strongly implies their technology peaked out not too far ahead of where we are right now. If everyone is transmitting signals you couldn't hear a thousand light years away with that same level of technology, then it might as well be a thousand people evenly scattered over a continent bellowing to each other, no one's within ten miles of each other to catch that. Worse in this case, those thousand people are scattered across time too, so the one twenty miles away from you might have died off long before you started listening. This is usually on the show where we argue these late filters don't work well, and indeed we will still argue that today, I would not have waited a year to do an episode on this topic if I thought it made a very strong case, 
but are no more reasoning goes that our current weapons aren't capable of obliterating humanity and that the types of things that could get us all need to be intelligent, like AI, and would just replace us. The Fermi Paradox doesn't care if you're made out of meat or metal any more than it cares if your species is Homo sapiens or Neanderthals. Our other end of this is that space travel is possible, even interstellar space travel, and we've discussed this a lot, even looking at low-tech ways of colonizing the galaxy such as in our episodes Colonizing the Galaxy and The Last Planet. What we don't tend to focus on is how you sustain the ecology on a trip across the stars or set one up on another planet, principally for two reasons. First, while we have done some episodes on that, like exporting Earth, I am a physicist, not a biologist, and tend to focus on those areas as a result, and our biology episodes often have a co-writer or active editor help you on them who is a biologist. The second is that biology is not a hard limit on colonization, and again the Fermi Paradox does not care if you are meat or metal. That's your ultimate fallback if your biology never gets good enough for colonizing the galaxy, back home someone is eventually going to come up with some post-biological approach. That might mean a von Neumann machine arriving and terraforming a planet from frozen samples or digitally printed DNA, as we discussed in Seeding the Stars, or it might be that Skynet colonized the galaxy with robots and computer minds. Either way, this option bypasses the stable ecology issue, mostly because we need to be mindful that post-biological or mechanical or digital civilizations would still have their own equivalents of ecosystems, and ecosystems is the key of a concept like Pan-Cosmoyo because it's a reminder that ecosystems and civilizations are not just something you drop in or print out that automatically functions and just keeps functioning. As an example, our ecology here on Earth is very dynamic. Last century's forest was a field or pond a century ago, and a farm now might be a forest next century, and its internal composition of critters and plants and food chains shifts constantly. And unless we found some planet that was an utter and impossible copy of Earth, we couldn't just dump life there and expect it to thrive like it did here. Indeed many current or past organisms on Earth would not thrive if dumped into a time machine to a different era of Earth, let alone another planet. Non-stop maintenance and intercession would be needed, even more so on some giant arc ship carrying colonists and zoos to some new planet that lacks its own life. A planet once terraformed, which would be a long and arduous process of many centuries, can de-terraform fairly quickly too. Also some big ship full of colonists numbering the tens of thousands might seem like a lot but compared to an entire planet, that's a group whose boots are very thin on the ground. And a lot of them are not volunteers anymore either. The kids that are born en route to the colony might decide that after they drop the colonists off, them and everyone else who either didn't volunteer or changed their mind are putting themselves on ice and flying back home to Earth. Or those that remain just don't manage to ever get that colony going as a walking civilization and it slowly falls apart. The Aurora Effect is named for the novel Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson and documents such a generation ship carrying a couple thousand people and 24 self-contained biomes. They journey at 10% of light speed to Tau Ceti and their ship basically turns into a dictatorship along the way, and when they do arrive they find the planet they plan to terraform has bacterial life on it that makes them sick. The entire colonial effort fails and they head home, and the book is decidedly pessimistic on colonization, which I assume was the author's intent, and so is the theory named for it. There's an undertone to a lot of settlement stories that we go to new worlds because we've messed up Earth and need a new place to wreck, but that's not how the game works. If you can't keep Earth habitable, you sure as heck can't make a dead rock like Mars work, and so if you approach humanity and Earth as doomed and think we're going to totally wreck Earth beyond repair, then you need look no farther for a Fermi Paradox solution, because terraforming new planets is beyond that civilization's skill and tends to imply that would be the case for other alien civilizations, and an example of a strong late filter if true. More broadly it carries on from the idea of percolation theory, which is the classic approach to sublight colonization of space. Here we assume only a small fraction of star systems are truly habitable and that we colonize those near us and wait until those grow or fail, and the ones that mature to modern numbers and infrastructure will send out their own colony ships to those in range rinse and repeat till you fill the galaxy. Except that you have multiple parameters in there and they can be set to cause it to extinguish rather than expand forever, 
especially if there's an additional cost to maintaining a planet as Earth-like that's not too close a copy, then only Earth could really operate at maximum for setting new ones out, and our daughter colonies are disadvantaged in repeating that. If your colony ship range is X, your chance of successfully arriving is Y, and your chance to establish and maintain a long-term growing civilization is Z, then those values don't need to be that low, especially if you're limited to Earth clones near Yellow Suns. To just make colonization fail completely, or peter out with a handful of colonies that rely on regular transmissions or shipments of data or DNA to keep themselves viable, especially if Earth stops setting them. Just as an example, if your odds at each of those two steps is 50-50, then only one in four of those colony expeditions you sent out is ever sending out another colony ship to a more distant world, and if your range is just 20 light years, there are only six G-type stars in that range. And if only half of those had an exoplanet we could plausibly terraform, you now have three candidates and a 1 in 4 chance a mission sent to one of them is sending out a duplicate in a few millennia, which would have fewer candidates on average since part of its own 20 light year sphere overlaps with Earth's sphere. This brings us to pan-cosmorial theory from Lee and Morgan Irons, a father-daughter team who produced the paper of that same name in 2023 and even though I do not agree with the conclusion many are drawing from it as an extension of the Aurora Effect, it is a great paper and establishes some excellent ways to categorize sustainability of any environment in space, I will link it in the episode description. Channel regulars already know most of those reasons and we will revisit them but let's summarize the theory first. It goes like this, Earth has unique conditions that help life evolve, and these conditions might not exist elsewhere. And what's more, the Earth life evolved on was very different than what life has turned into after a few billion years, and that life is adapted to this modern incarnation of Earth. The study looks at how Earth and the Sun, as its ultimate power source, maintain life-friendly environments amidst the vastness of space. It reasons, entirely properly, that if humans try to live in places without Earth-like conditions, we might face challenges, like resource shortages and societal collapses and that the smaller those ecosystems or the less Earth-like they are, the more input from Earth is going to be needed to keep them going. Needless to say, it's hard to maintain supply chains in space, especially over interstellar distances, so any fragile colony that is dependent on that supply chain for survival is vulnerable, and those that are just barely sustainable on their own could fall apart quickly if something went wrong, like an internal civil war. Suppose we build a space habitat orbiting Titan with a big parabolic dish near it to focus sunlight to grow food. We ship that food down to the nitrogen and methane mines of Titan and they pay in those goods, which we stuff into big pods and ship home to space habitats in the asteroid belt or near Earth who want that nitrogen and methane. Those ships were torn with new immigrants, new biological seeds and specimens, and manufactured goods. It is not that hard to imagine damage to that dish, or civil unrest, or label disputes disrupting one of those trade nodes, or even just some comet miners undercutting the business and leaving Titan to wilt. All the more reason for them to want to diversify their trade and have more partners and clients so they're not as vulnerable, but that may be hard to get started if the trade is already marginal. And frequently a settlement is started when it is marginal rather than waiting till it's easier. The early board gets the worm and the bit left off is that the other board starves to death. Many of these problems can be fixed by building bigger, or getting in an occasional shipment of DNA or frozen samples from home, but that all needs resources and if you're suddenly tight on those you've got a problem, and we see this in play in the economic ecosystem of countless towns. Roads crumble while crime rises and the tax base decays while new business is just not attracted to coming in there. Any catastrophe is likely to disrupt things even worse and is more likely to occur and be severe as you don't have the resources to prevent or to mitigate them as well. One day you end up with a ghost town. This does not mean everyone died either. That colony is probably not politically independent, not with jugular veins that big, so while their patrons might get exhausted sending resupply, they probably would send a ship to take people home, likely after sending a new manager there with some resources to try to get things moving again first. Indeed it might be common practice for colony endeavors under planning to be able to show plausible business plans to investors and have an insurance policy specifically covering the cost of bringing in a crisis management team and resupply, and then of having everyone come home if the benchmarks for sustainability get missed and failure is getting inevitable. 
But that is another non-biological example of a drain on a colony because that's being paid out of a budget somewhere, even if it's essentially a measure of taxpayer support and political willpower to send missions. We could effectively build a fairly large equivalent to the normal Fermi Paradox filters for the late filter process of successfully colonizing a planet that in turn colonizes another planet, percolating out. And I'd emphasize the non-biological examples because channel regulars already know what the usual answer to those biological ones will be. Build your ecosystems bigger, build more of them, be open to using genetic engineering, cybernetics, and post-biological approaches. Returning to the paper, as I said it gives us a nice classification system, and not just for ecosystems, and in four intuitive levels that I'll simplify out of the paper, which discusses them more in a thermodynamics context. Level 1 is our classic space opera planet where there's some differences with Earth but the gravity and sunlight and other factors permit a stable ecosystem that needs no further input after initial settlement to stay around for millions if not billions of years. I would personally guess there's fewer than a billion plants like that in the galaxy, maybe even tens of millions, as we don't really know how narrow the eye of that habitable needle is that we need to thread. And this is the keystone the idea in the percolation and aurora effect context, because if you have less than a billion level 1 planets out there in our galaxy, all potential M-type planets I suppose we could say, then you would only expect one or two of them within a 50 light year radius of Earth which means you need colony ships able to plausibly travel that far with a high chance of arriving and with enough people and resources to pull that settlement off without anything but technical help transmitted from home. That's as much as a 1000 year journey with an Orion Drive spaceship moving at 5% of light speed and that's a very heavy lift. And again, this is the basis of using this as a Fermi Paradox solution. It is entirely reasonable then to say that we need to be able to do much less hospitable ecosystems in the long term to make space colonization work, especially since a voyage of several centuries presumably is required and expecting a spaceship, multi-generational crew, and onboard ecosystem to survive for that time is also a very heavy lift. But that takes us to Level 2, which is more of the category we think of for space settlement on this channel where some degree of alteration, genetic or cybernetic, to the people or some organisms would be needed for a completely stable ecosystem, or you would need some supply chain to keep it going, and this is a potentially brittle ecosystem as you are constantly bringing in outside resources, which represents a supply chain that accident or warfare can disrupt, and same for some large piece of eco-engineering hardware like a parabolic sun dish at Titan or a single huge solar shade at L1 for Venus. And this is the circumstance for colonizing our own solar system, and we usually reason that this is what we do before sending colony ships into deep space, since that makes for good science fiction, but crazy policy. If you can't make settlements work here, it's too soon to send them to distant suns. The early bird may get the worm, but not if it doesn't wait till it learns to fly first. Level 3 goes further though, and it fits better for our classic arc ship. Here we assume there's not enough room or energy in the system to avoid cascade failures, that based on Titan we discussed earlier would fit this, being relatively small and using a parabolic dish to focus light in for heat, photosynthetic light, and energy. If something smashes that dish, then they could freeze to death before they might repair it. That's something they would obviously plan for and have backups for, so our Titan case isn't a real level 3 but an arc ship 20 years out from Earth running on a pair of fission reactors and a limited stockpile of replacement parts certainly is. Level 4 is something like the existing International Space Station that must have a strong umbilical core to Earth just to survive temporarily, and which has no plausible scenarios for independent existence, and this would apply to most Moon and Mars based designs as well as places like McMurdo Station in Antarctica and we could imagine this still being done for interstellar travel in FTL scenarios, your outpost that a ship with warp drive reaches to resupply every year and changes over crew, your Stargate connected planet that suddenly has that gate disconnect or break, but otherwise you would be insane to have an interstellar outpost or colony that was intended to be level 4 at any point beyond when it was in dock around Earth being built and taking on supplies and crew. When its engines turn on and it leaves that dock, it needs to be as independent and self-sufficient as it can, not level 4. 
The paper dips a lot more into thermodynamics and discussion of cascade failure, power sources, growth, blight, diversity loss, and cascade failure hypothesis, and it is absolutely a great basis for a planning chart for a colony, but again, not a Fermi Paradox solution in and of itself with the exception of where it just got to the point that the constant stacking issues and problems for sediment, each individually solvable, and probably even as a group, had still just piled up to the point that nobody wanted to try it, and thinking about the constant roadblocks to returning to the moon and setting up a base there, it certainly is believable that could happen. However, as we so often discuss, it just requires us to be too wrong about too many of those near-horizon technologies that kick you into being a true post-scarcity civilization, and make problems like this not just solvable but also appealing to a civilization that basically wants for nothing but a good challenge. Exploration and expansion make for fairly satisfying purposes to humans by default, and probably any other critter that came up Darwin's ladder like we did. And again, for my part, I never assume we colonize space because we need a new home or fear extinction otherwise, rather I just tend to assume humanity a couple hundred years from now just has very impressive physical and medical technologies, and desires to tackle the problem and claim new suns. Space travel is a lot less risky if your body is pumped full of tailored bacteria and nanobots that can prolong your life indefinitely and your boring day job is a one day a week, eight hour shift at the local paperclip factory making sure the robots don't go off the hinge when corporate sends them a note to maximize paperclip production ahead of the start of the school year. So when someone suggests building a 20 mile long space hulk for the low low price of 20 trillion bucks, you're viewing that in the same way we would if someone said let's build a skyscraper. It's also not using brand new untested technologies, it's using the same hydroponic systems that a hundred space habitats out beyond the belt have perfected, and the same 3D printers that everyone's been using to manufacture replacement parts for interplanetary ships far from port for the last century. You are not sending a colony ship to one level one planet, you are sending a fleet there, and you are sending a fleet to every star nearby and have got the closed loop ecosystem thing down to such an art that you don't care what spectrum of sunlight that star shines down on whatever dead rocks pass for planets that are orbiting it. You know what you've got, you know how to use it, and you can make it and fix it. You've got the recipes for success. So long as you have that and a decent power supply, you're good. With a good library of knowledge and tech specs and some decent automation and 3D printing, probably including DNA printing from an archive of organisms, then likely you can keep your level 2 and 3 ecosystems from undergoing cascade failure. The takeaway would be that you are militarily and diplomatically vulnerable to anyone in a position to stress those factors, especially if they are more robust to them than you are. Which is how you can use diplomacy, trade, and military muscle to create interplanetary nations, but that vulnerability doesn't hamper interstellar growth because the same issues that make interstellar travel difficult also make it difficult to externally yank on those vulnerabilities from light years away. Of course it doesn't prevent internal strife from sparking off a cascade failure, a century away from help or rescue, or any court of law, which is a fair closing point to remember because the thing that allows us to make level 2 and 3 environments effectively sustainable level 1s is advanced technology and human willpower and intellect. You cannot tamper-proof these colony ships or colonies, even freezing the colonists for the trip is not a total solution. Humanity is traditionally its own worst threat and you are exporting that wherever you export us. Enormous nuclear-powered ships can get you to new worlds, and automated resource gatherers and manufacturers can help craft huge domes and terraforming equipment to reshape worlds, but they can absolutely also make missiles and tanks too. So while you probably would not need help from distant Earth, or need to fear them controlling you, you do have potential problems closer to your new home to consider. You have the ability to forge a new world into a paradise, but if your colonists don't agree on what that paradise should look like, the battle to determine that might not just delay it being accomplished, but potentially leave your new living world once more a dead and barren rock. One of the bedrocks of science and futurism speculation is modeling systems, and we see that with pancosmorial theory and how the model exposes a lot of potential weaknesses in classic ideas of space colonization. 
We also saw how minor crises and catastrophes here on Earth could be ruinous to fledgling colonies if unprepared. A lot of times those models and topics can sound complicated, and part of my job is to walk through these ideas in a fun and easy way to help folks learn more about them. That's the same philosophy our friends over at Brilliant have, fun and interactive learning, and Brilliant is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. They have thousands of lessons on these topics, including tons of interactive visualizations of probability and modeling. From simple to complex, whatever your skill level, Brilliant customizes content to fit your needs and lets you solve at your own pace. The world is an amazing but chaotic place, and Brilliant can be an excellent partner for exploring it. Prepare for your future and build a daily learning habit to future-proof yourself, in bite-sized intuitive bits and at your own pace. Try Brilliant out for free, for a full 30 days, by visiting Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur, or clicking on the link in the description, and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So that wraps up our first episode for 2024, but we have plenty more to come continuing this Sunday, January 7th, where we will deep dive into the functions and uses of statites, lagites, quasites, solar moths, mag sails, and other alternatives to classic Keplerian satellites and orbits that offer us the possibility to move stars or transform solar systems. And speaking of transformation, in the future we might transform animals into more intelligent critters, or even human intelligence, in a process called uplifting, and in two weeks we'll discuss the ethical challenges of that endeavor. Then on January 14th it'll be time for Sci-Fi Sunday and a look at aliens vs AI, and which is a greater threat to us and who would win in a fight between the two. And we'll discuss regulating space on January 18th. Then in three weeks we'll talk about settling all Lagrange points and why a society at L5 would be awesome. Then we'll close out the month with a look at how our universe might have began, and how other previous universes might have predated ours in conformal cyclic cosmology. One month, eight episodes. Welcome to 2024. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Giant Space Monsters at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.